Well, hello, all of you precious people, students of the Word of the Lord. And uh, last week, we gave you an introduction to a series of lessons on what I guess you could call the, the second fruit of the Spirit. I guess there's a couple ways you look at it. You could, you could look at this like it's uh, uh, different kinds of fruit, you know, like apples and bananas and, and that type of thing. Or uh, I prefer to look at it like a, a, cr a cluster of grapes or uh, uh, a bunch of bananas. Uh, I guess I like that analogy better because it's called the fruit of the Spirit. So uh, one Spirit <clears throat> with multiple fruit. And uh, so if, if, we, uh, <clears throat> if we look at it like that, I guess we're looking at uh, grape number two. <laughs> or the second banana in the bunch. And of course, in true Herald fashion, I'm chasing rabbits and I'm complicating a very simple subject. We're talking about joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. I don't think there's a better book about joy than the book of Philippians. And if you remember, when I stopped, I introduced to you uh, what I felt was a theme for all four chapters. And... Uh, one, of course, was the single mind, and then uh, you had a submitted mind and a spiritual mind and a secure mind. But tonight, we're going to deal with the single mind. And uh, this, 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 this is so fascinating to me. Here's Philippians 1 and verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. This, this man had one goal in his life, to live as Christ and to die as gain. He had one goal, and that was to spread the gospel. After his encounter with the Lord on the Damascus Road, nothing else mattered. And, and, and he knew that God in glorified flesh sat on the throne, and he was in complete control. The Lord Almighty, omnipotent, reigneth. And that word reigneth in the original language means <clears throat> it's, it's happening and it's going to keep on happening. He's not going to stop. Reigneth is a, is a progressive situation and, it, and it's not just that it has a finality to it. And, and so Paul knew the key to the empire was Rome. Millions, millions could come to Christ if he could conquer that city. And so when you read the word, he had every intention of going to Rome. Here's Acts 19 and verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. When uh, he was at Corinth, here's Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul wanted to go to Rome as a preacher. Instead, many would believe he went as a prisoner. And he could have written, think of the letter that Paul could have written about the details of just getting there. Uh, we studied the book of Acts one time for a year in Bible class. And, and, and between Acts 21, 17 and the end of chapter 28, all we did was deal with the details of his, what it was, because it was an illegal arrest over the lie of bringing Gentiles into the temple. He didn't do that. For two whole years, he was imprisoned in Caesarea. He had to endure the frustration of Felix and Festus, the bribe that Herod Agrippa II was waiting for. Finally, his right to go before Caesar is honored, and he's transported in chains to a ship. The ship goes into a storm, sinks. He spends three months on the island of Malta, bitten by a snake, on and on we can go, but here's what I found. 1 and 17, the things which happened unto me. See, I think a lesser man would have questioned God 
and possibly become bitter, but not Paul. <clears throat> These were not chains that man had placed on him. He called them the bonds of Christ. He knew the Lord was in charge. And, and you think of this. this. This is what amazes me. If it would have been me, I would have gone through all the horrible details of, 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 of going there. And you said, but, but, but he did write it. No, 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 no. We're, we're in the book of Acts. Acts was not written by Paul. It's written by Luke. Luke is the one that wrote about everything that Paul went through. Paul didn't go through all of the stuff here. Later on one time he said, <clears throat> okay, you want, you, want, you want me to tell you my resume? Here it is. But he, he even felt guilty after he did it. This is Luke going through all the details of Paul's life. And when he gets there, he said, I'm not a prisoner. These are the bonds of Christ. And, and, and he said, everything that's happened, listen to this, everything that's happened has fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. So I did a little homework on that word furtherance. And uh, it's, it's a Greek military term that means pioneer advance. It was what the Greek army would call their engineers that went in front of the troops to open the way into a new territory. The military today has the Corps of Engineers. Before they stormed the beaches of Normandy, engineers swam there to sample the sand and the soil to know if, they could, if, the, if the beaches would support the tanks and those, those, those Higgins boats that they used to unload those troops and other support vehicles. Paul understood he was out there in the front preparing the way for what was to follow. So he wasn't confined. He was, in fact, opening up new areas of ministry. And if you're a minister or you ever want to be, you won't study preachers long before you're coming across a man called the Prince of Preachers. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached in the New Park Street Church in, in London. Um, I... I I, I was always fascinated with Spurgeon. He, they, they counted the crowd one time. 23,654 people were in the, in the room. And without the aid of a microphone, everyone said they could hear Spurgeon very clearly. Every week, every week, Spurgeon's sermons were translated into 20 languages. And 23,000 copies of his sermons were sold every week. He is estimated to have preached to over 10 million people in his lifetime. And he would often ask regular members not to attend next Sunday service so someone else could come. And when they refused the next week, he literally made all of them leave. He dismissed everybody out of the church. And as soon as they left, it immediately filled back up again with the people who'd been standing outside waiting to get in. And a lot of people talk about Spurgeon, but you won't ever read much about his wife, Susanna. She, she so respected her husband, she called him Tishatha, which is a Persian phrase which means your excellency. She loved him and she revered him. And, uh, but as a young mother, she, she, she was stricken and would be confined to a bed for the rest of her life. And yet she started what was known back then as the book fund, getting her husband's material into the hands of less fortunate ministers who couldn't afford the books and couldn't afford the, the sermons. See, sometimes God puts bonds on people to get them to accomplish a pioneer advance. Susanna Wesley had 19 children, but out of those 19 came two brothers, John and Charles, considered one of the greatest ministry teams of word and song ever. Fanny Crosby. You ever heard of Fanny Crosby? Blind when she was six weeks old, but she was the one that wrote this. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, 
washed in his blood. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Blind Fanny, praising my Jesus all the day long. She was credited with authoring over 8,000 songs. Wow. These are people who rejoice over what God is doing, and they're not living their life regretting over what he didn't do. 1 and 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest, watch, in the palace and in all other places. I, I, the word, the Greek word for palace is praetorian, which is the headquarters of these praetorians, which these were the elite soldiers in the Roman Empire. Every day, Paul was chained to one of these 9,000 elite troops. How else would they ever hear the gospel? Do you think these guys are going to take the time to listen to some Jewish missionary if he visited the city and tried to talk to them? These men, for months on end, were forced into his company, and they fell under his charm in the anointing of the Holy Ghost under the most terrifying conditions. They heard him pray. They heard him dictate letters. They attended his messages, throngs that visited him from the city but the witness went beyond the guards. It went into Caesar's household. So the palace staff were one to Christ. Here's chapter 4 at the end. He said, all the saints salute you, salute you chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. So Paul wrote this letter about 60 AD. Five years later, Nero would turn on the Christians. He set the city on fire but he blamed it on the Christians. And the early writings of a historian, his name is Tacitus. He was a Roman senator, but he was a famous historian, and his book still exists. And I, I read one called The Annals, and it tells of vast multitudes of converts in the capital city of Rome. These were the people who would read the letter that he wrote to them many years before that said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise, the unwise. As much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. This, The way Paul was dealing with his condition gave boldness to other people. He said in 1 and 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Listen to these next verses. Here's 15. Some indeed preach Christ of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Watch. Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I rejoice, and I will rejoice. So he's saying some preach Christ of goodwill, others were jealous of Paul. But it's interesting to study the original words because the Greek word for affliction here means the painful irritation that comes from the friction created when a chains rub a prisoner's skin. <laughs> These are the people who take pleasure when others have a reverse of fortune. These are the people that rejoice when you're in trouble. Boy, these people didn't know Paul. He was bigger than they were. He had small-minded enemies, and he had some great-hearted friends. And the crazy thing is, <clears throat> they weren't preaching a false gospel. They were preaching the truth. So he said, I don't care how they preach Christ, just as long as Christ is preached. Some were building their own kingdom. Some were unquestionably doing things uh, that were questionable. But, but, but 
but Christ was being preached. And, and uh, I wouldn't dream of using a man like Balaam. But God did. If I was God, I would have never used David at the horrible sin of Uriah and Bathsheba. But God did. And Paul said in verse 19, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as also, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he's overlooking the mean spirit of jealous people and rejoicing that the gospel is being preached. He's got a single mind. He's not distracted with other people. The thing that drives him is, I want the message to get out. And he focused on the preaching and not on the preachers. Let me show you a Bible principle. Here's Philippians 1 and 15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Here's James 3 and 16. For where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. You see, envy and strife go together like love and unity go together. And the Greek word, this is fascinating, the Greek, Greek word for contention literally means to canvas for office, to try to get somebody to vote you in. So these men are self-seekers, and they're jealous. I, I read a great story years ago about two very, very famous preachers. One was John Wesley, and the other was a guy named George Whitefield. They were very, very, very successful, but their opinions about things in the Scripture were very different. And they tried to bait John Wesley one time. And during an interview, they, they asked him, do you expect to see George Whitefield in heaven? And John Wesley simply said, no, I don't think I'll ever see him there. And they are convinced now they've got fodder for their cannon. They're, 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 they pressed him because, oh, we got a really good story here. we got one preacher hating another. And he said... Uh, they asked him, they said, why don't you think George Whitefield is converted? <laughs> and Wesley replied, of course he's converted. He said, but the new Jerusalem will be a vast place. And he will be so close to the throne. And I will be so far from it that I don't ever expect to get that close to the throne of the Lord in order to see my brother George. <laughs> How could he be like this? I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit. I, I can't answer for them, he's saying, but I can answer for me, and I expect my case to turn out victoriously because you're praying for me. And I like that phrase, the supply of the Spirit. Remember what he said, my God shall supply all of your needs? <laughs> so it's like, let's make a trade. You've got needs, I've got a God. Let my God supply all of your needs because, you know, Ephesians talks about the riches, the riches of the grace of Jesus Christ. They, they don't have a bottom to them. And he was saying that my example and my testimony had given boldness to believers to stand for the gospel. And I don't want to let them down at my trial by compromising or misrepresenting the gospel when I go to court and stand in front of that suspicious, paranoid Nero. And I know I won't because, number one, you're praying for me. And number two, I have the vast supply of the Spirit to draw on. The word supply in Greek is the English is where the English word chorus comes from. And when I study the word, the background is that when a Greek city had a special festival, somebody had to pay for the singers and dancers. And the donation had to be a lavish one, and the word came to mean a chorus. 
provided by a very generous and lavish donation. So Paul was not depending on his dwindling resources. He was depending on the generous donation that had been ministered to him through the Spirit. And there are three things that go hand in hand here. Because of his chains, Christ was known. That's verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. So Christ is known because of his chains, but he also said Christ is known because of my critics, because he said, whether they preach him of contention or of truth, I don't care, Christ is preached. And he said, because of the crisis, Christ is magnified. Listen to this verse. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as also, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. I, I, they're going to pull up a picture for you now. This is an old logo that I found years ago from an early Baptist organization in the 1800s. And if you look at it, it's got an oxen in the middle of it. And on one side is an altar. And on the other side is the plow. And there's the inscription above it, we're ready for either. If we have to go to the field and plow, we're ready to do that. If we have to go to the altar, we're ready to do that. And I hope I don't, I don't want to bore you with words, but the word for magnified is referring to an instrument to make something bigger. Paul was saying, I want my life to be a, a telescope or a microscope. I want to take something that is possibly very far away from many of you and very small to many of you and bring it close and make it big. I want the Lord to, to be really close to you and I want the Lord to be really big to you and I want this to happen to you through what I'm going through. And if that will happen by my life, so be it. And if that will happen by my death, so be it. But he said, I want to reflect Jesus by living the way he lived and speaking what he said and if required, dying the way he died. So this is very important because that whole manifestation of God is through flesh. And, and, and a word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory. And that's what Paul was saying. The very fact that Jesus is, is, is the manifestation of the invisible God, then I want my life to be a revealer of an invisible truth, something that you'd never seen before and never understood. Now you understand it through what I'm going through and not just what I'm going through, but how, what my attitude is like while I'm going through. Let's say you're a lying thief who has cared for nothing but yourself. And now you're convinced there's no hope for you. How does God feel about that? You need to ask a guy named Zacchaeus and he'll tell you the answer to that question. Let's say you were a prostitute. You had seven devils in you. You're convinced there's no hope for you. How does God feel about that? Why don't you go to the Word and find out what Mary Magdalene had to say? Let's say you used to be really close to Jesus, but you dropped the ball. I mean, really dropped the ball. Not once, not twice, but three times in a row on the same day. And you're convinced he doesn't ever even want to see you again. How does God feel about that? Well, let's ask Peter. Do you get it? God didn't say it. Jesus said it. That flesh was a telescope and a microscope to bring something very far away and very small now to become very close and very big. And Paul wants to do the same thing with his life. It doesn't say we saw Jesus. It says we beheld the glory of the Father. So to most people, Jesus lived a long time ago in a very small place far from here. But when the unsaved see a believer, 
go through a crisis, Jesus gets magnified and gets up close. I, I heard Janice White say something powerful to me one day. She nursed and ministered her former husband days before he died, stayed with him in his room, and released him from the mountain of guilt he carried for years for his actions that resulted in their divorce. And when people asked her, Janice, how can you do that? How can you be so caring towards someone that was so cruel to you? And she said, it's called the Holy Ghost. <laughs> she said, I am a means to magnify the master to the world. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I can't say it any better than that. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I don't know who's listening to me now, but I've got a faithful following of people that are so in love with your word that they meet with me every week through the means of this social media. I'm asking you, God, to be with him. You said angels camp around them that fear you. And I'm believing you, God, that right now, let us not be like a broom ending in hundreds of different directions. But let us remember what Paul taught. This one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. So we can either be have a broomed life and going in lots of directions, or we can be like a spear and have one prominent point and that point is going to be, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ, and I'm going to please him with my life. I love you, and it's an honor to have been in your home tonight, and I trust that we'll be together soon. God bless every one of you. Keep your mind single, all right? You stay safe. We'll keep you in touch. God bless every one of you.